church. The church picnic. It's going to be here uh, at the church. And we are having sign-ups for site dishes uh, in the foyer after service. They will be taking sign-ups. So please, uh, if you have it in your heart to contribute, sign up to bring a side dish. Uh, the church is providing hamburgers and hot dogs for us to eat and the slides for the kids to you know, have a good time and we can have good fellowship, amen? You know, with God's people, you know, having fun together. Um, and this is August 3rd, starts at 10, 10 a.m. I almost said p.m., man, trying to get... Also, on Sunday night, we do have a Zoom Bible study. It is online. Like I said, it's a Zoom Bible study led by our brother, Les Noriel. Most of you have met him and, and re probably remember him. Uh, he used to be one of our elders, deacons here. And so he continued to serve the people of this church by, and others by having an online class. For more information on the class, I believe he's going, still going through the, the Minor Prophets, brother. Still going through the Minor Prophets, if you're interested in learning more about that. Uh, see our brother, Kenny Chan, back there. Kenny, raise your hand, please. There's Kenny. So that's who you see for more information on how to get on and join the Zoom Bible study. Also, VBS is still going strong on Wednesday night, 7 p.m., Please bring your kids, kids of all ages. We have something for them. And also adults, stay. Pastor is go doing a magnificent job through a, with a Bible study through 2 Kings. 2 Kings, he's really doing a great job. So there's something for kids of every age, including the kids in the adult age, right? Yeah? Okay. So now we have executive board. We have a quarterly meeting after service, and that is today. So if you're on the executive board, please make plans to attend after service. Also, on Tuesday nights at 7, p 7 p.m., wow, Women of the Word are meeting. They, uh, they started last week. They have uh, about three more sessions. So, but you are, ladies, you are welcome to come and join. For more information, you can see our sister, Roberta Abeda, and I think she's in the nursery right now. So, or in the foyer, and you can see her. Women of the Word. And last but not least, men, something for you as well. Useful for the Master. That is a workman of the, of the Word. And it's a, a conference, it's a useful for the Master Conference, Saturday, July 27th, that's next Saturday. Pastor has, has told them that uh, we would have 12 from this church. I think we're going to meet that, if not surpass that. Man, it's a good thing for us to go and learn more about the Word of God and how to become men of God. Men of God. Often, all the times we have things for the ladies, 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 men. Let's step up to the plate. Let's get closer to God and lead our families in the Word of God. Amen? So it's this Saturday. If you'd like to, see Pastor. Uh, if you want to go in the church van, there's only a limited amount of seats, or you have to take your own car. That's at FFBC Whittier is where it's going to be held. It starts at uh, 8 a.m. to 3 p.m., and, and lunch is included. And best thing... Well, the best thing is the Word of God. Second best thing, it's free. It's free. I think they're having tri-tip. Am I correct, brother? Yeah. Tri-tip. For more information, see our brother Franklin Rivas. Franklin, please raise your hand. That's Franklin there, man. Every man here should go. Or I'm encouraging every man here to go. That's the extent of our announcements. Have a blessed day. Pastor? Any of you men need a flyer, raise your hand. They should, uh, should all have a flyer for the conference. If uh, I don't hear from you, then you'll just uh, meet us over there. The address is on the flyer. But if you would like to uh, get into the van, I know what you're thinking. I don't want to be in that van. It's, the air conditioner is kind of iffy, and uh, I don't blame you. 
I think I'd probably take my own car. But, you know, if you'd like to go together, we can try that. <clears throat> All right. Praise the Lord. Are there any first-time visitors this morning? Anybody here for the first time? Raise your hand. We have a little gift we want to give to you. Any first-timers? All right. Praise the Lord. We have... Uh, we have a special uh, baby dedication this morning. And I like the couple to come forward. Well, we do have a special guest, little Levi Arroyo Peraza. Praise the Lord. What a good-looking little guy right here. He is the son of Justin and Karina. And here in this church, we do not baptize babies. He will wait till he's an adult and choose to be baptized. But we do dedicate babies. We dedicate them to the Lord Jesus Christ. We dedicate their parents especially because Levi cannot drive. <laughs> Justin and Karina have to bring him to church. It starts off in the nursery and then he starts going through the Sunday school program, children's church, and eventually, Lord willing, he's in here with the adults. Like many of you, many of you did the whole sequence. So the word of God tells us that Jesus has a very special place in his heart for the children. He told his apostles, allow the children to come to me. Do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. He also said, for anyone that caused these little ones to stumble, it would be better for that man if a heavy millstone was hung around his neck and cast into the depths of the sea. So we are going to hold little Levi now. It's a good looking little guy. You want to say something? Huh? Praise the Lord. Now the Lord has entrusted Levi to his parents, to Justin and Karina, but he's also entrusted him to this church of which you are a part. So we are committing ourselves to helping his parents raise him in the Lord. So let's bow in a word of prayer as we commit Levi unto the Lord Jesus. Our Father, we come before you and pray for little Levi, that you would protect him, that you would watch over him. We pray for his parents, that you would bless them, Lord, and encourage them as they strive to raise him in a very difficult time. And we ask, Lord, that we as a church would be up to the task, that we would do all that we can to make sure that he has good care, good teaching, and that we would uh, be responsible and committed to him as well as a body of Christ. And we thank you for this little life. Do something great with him. We know he has a sister. We pray for her as well. 
And we thank you, Lord, and we commit him to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 He's a good little guy. Praise the Lord. Is he always that well behaved? <laughs> all right. <clears throat> well, you all have an outline. We're going to cover part one. Jude, one chapter in the book of Jude. 25 verses. The theme of Jude. How to contend for the faith. How to contend for the faith. We're going to look at five principles this morning, and then next week we'll probably look at another five. But how do you contend for the faith? Let's begin reading in Jude, verse 1. Jude a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James to those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you, and here's our theme, contend earnestly for the faith. That you contend earnestly for the faith. Now, before I continue on, do you guys all have Bibles? Do you need, need a loaner Bible? Karina, do your guests need Bibles? Um, or do you have one? Do they have one? Maybe we can get one. Yeah, we have, uh, there should be some in the back there. All right. Okay. How to contend for the faith. First of all, you must be totally submitted to Christ. Totally submitted to Christ. Verse 1, Jude, he's the author of this book. Jude, who is Jude? Well, he's the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus had at least four brothers. We call them half-brothers because Jesus was not born of Joseph. Jesus was born of God. Jesus was born of Mary, but Jesus did not have a human father. He had a legal father, Joseph, but not a biological father. So after Jesus was born, Joseph and Mary had other children. So they would be Jesus' half-siblings. So Judas, excuse me, Jude, he's called Judas, not Iscariot, but in the Gospels, he's known as Judas. Here he's called Jude. He's the half-brother of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Who is James? James is not the author of the book of James. James is the head of the early church. We know that from the book of Acts. So Jude and James were half-brothers of Jesus. But John tells us they were unbelievers at first. They did not believe in him. John chapter 7. John 7, verse 5. 
For not even his brothers, now Jude would be one of those, for not even his brothers were believing in him. His own brothers did not believe in him. So what happened from that point to this point in Jude? Where Jude is writing this beautiful one chapter. Jude is now calling himself a bond servant of Jesus Christ. How did he go from being a half-brother, an unbeliever, to a bondservant? I'm a bondservant. He got saved. After the resurrection, the brothers of Jesus, at least Jude and James, committed their whole life to Jesus Christ. He was their Lord, not just their brother now. He was the Lord Jesus Christ to them. He became a bond servant. And so have you. So have we. This is one of the most popular designations of what a Christian is. What is a Christian? A Christian is a bond servant. What is a bond servant? A slave. One that is owned by someone. Complete devotion. A bond servant. We are bond servants of Jesus Christ. We have been bought with a price. 1 Corinthians 6. Gives us more of an idea of what a bond servant is. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. Now you might say, I'm not a servant of anyone. I'm a free man. I'm a free human being. I live in the United States. I'm free. I'm not a servant to anyone. Yes, you are. You're a slave of someone. You're a slave of someone. You're either a slave of Satan and don't know it, or you're a slave, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. The only question is, whose slave are you? Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Who bought you? The Lord Jesus Christ bought you. With his precious blood, you've been bought with a price. You are, not, you are not your own. You belong to him. You're a what? A bond servant. A slave of Christ. So if you're going to contend earnestly for the faith, you must be totally submitted to Christ. You must be his bond servant. Now back in our text... Secondly, you must be overwhelmed with the wonderful work of God in your life. There's something miraculous about what God has done for you. You've got to be overwhelmed as you meditate upon what God has done for you. You've got to be amazed at what God has done for you, what God is doing for you. If you're going to contend for the faith, You've got to be overwhelmed when you think about it. Look at verse 1, Jude 1. And we're still in the first verse. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy and and peace and love be multiplied to you. Now let's, let's unpack that. That's what we do here. We take 
take sections of scripture and we just kind of dig into the word of God. We dig into it. We unpack it. We ask questions. We try to understand it. Let's try to understand this. To those who are the called. God called you. He called you to himself. Now, there are two kinds of calls in scripture. There's the general call where God calls all men to himself. And then there is what is called the efficacious call, the specific call, the irresistible call, where God calls you and you respond. You respond. He called you to himself. You respond. I think I told you this story. My dad would whistle to us and we'd always respond. I heard his whistle here at the church. I was by myself. And I heard a whistle. I don't know where it came from. The neighbors somewhere. And I instinctively responded. And he's been dead for 15 years. Right? Maybe more. But I instinctively responded to the whistle. It sounded just like my dad's whistle. When he whistled for us, we responded. Now I've tried to duplicate that over the years with my own kids and it doesn't seem to work. <laughs> Didn't have the same effect. When God whistles for you, you respond. He called you. If you're a believer here, God at some point in your life, he called you to himself. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13 2 Thessalonians If you can't find it, don't worry, it takes a while to figure it all out. I'll just read it. Half the time I can't find things. 2 Thessalonians 2:13 It says here, but we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation. God chose you from the beginning of creation for salvation. He elected you. He predestined you. He chose you for salvation through the sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth, it was for this he called you through, the, through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. What did he do? He called you. And you responded. He whistled for you. And you said, here I am. What do you need me to do? So God called you. Now, back in Jude, verse 1, not only that, those who are the called, beloved, beloved in God the Father. He loved you. He called you. He loved you. You are the beloved. Now I did a little research on that word. And I said, what's the difference of beloved? How come he didn't just say loved because beloved is a more intense word than loved so gentlemen sometimes you call your wife your love my love you can now refer to her as your beloved it'll go a lot farther because it's a lot more intense it's intense. God loved you. You are beloved 
in God the Father. He loved you. You are His beloved. Next time you feel lonely and think, nobody loves me, I have no love in this world. God the Father, you are His beloved. He loves you. How did He demonstrate His love for you? He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for your sins so that you can have eternity in heaven with Him. How much does he love me? He stretched out his arms. I love you this much. This much. As he hung on the cross, he loves you. So, you are called. You are beloved. And then, you are protected. Verse 1. To those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Kept. Protected. He keeps you. He protects you. I was thinking of how I could uh, illustrate that. And I asked my wife's permission to use her in this illustration. I don't want to give the wrong impression. But she keeps special things that I want to to throw away. <laughs> and we have three sheds. What are in those sheds? Special things. We have a whole box. When Jonathan was young, he would make paper sculptures with tape and little, you know, at the time they were cute, little things out of paper, you know, tape them. They're all in the box. She's kept them. Throw them away. He doesn't want them anymore. They just look like crumbled up paper now. No, those are his sculptures. <laughs> Don't touch them. So they're protected. Old schoolwork, boxes of schoolwork, when they were going through school, all five of them, when they're going through school. I mean, not everything, but you know, special things. Report cards, cards from people, they're all kept. We have names for these sheds. This is the sweet shed that I personally built years ago. Six feet by ten feet. With a lot of beautiful things that are kept protected from people like me that want to just clean it all out. No, they're kept. Leave the sculptures there. They're kept. They're precious. They're memories. Now, I know what's going to happen someday when we die. The kids aren't going to take any of them. They're going to discard all of it. Maybe they'll keep a few things, but I doubt if the box full of paper sculptures is going to last. Anyway, that's an illustration. You are kept for Jesus Christ. You're protected. Nobody's going to throw you away. You're protected in that shed, the sweet shed. You are, you are protected by somebody that values you, somebody that loves you, somebody that wants your memories to be uh, protected. You are kept by Jesus Christ. You're not going to lose your salvation. Kept. That'd be a good, that'd be a good uh, t-shirt. Kept. Hey, what does that word mean? Get a t-shirt made with, with kept. Have your dad make t-shirts kept. What does that mean? Jude verse 1. You're protected. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter 1 verse 4. Now, a lot of people believe you can't really know if you're saved or not. And if you are saved, you might lose your salvation. No, error, wrong. Once you're saved, you're always saved because Jesus, because God keeps you for Jesus. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected or kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. 
God protects you. Now here's the third point. How to contend for the faith? First of all, you must totally submit to Christ. You're his bondservant. Secondly, you must be overwhelmed with God's amazing work. He calls you. He loves you. He keeps you. Thirdly, you must be totally committed to the faith. Look at verse 3. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, he wanted to write originally about their common salvation, the Holy Spirit changed his plans. I wanted to write about our common salvation, but I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. <clears throat> contend earnestly for the faith. The fa con contend earnestly, beautiful, for the faith. What is the faith? The faith is that body of Christian doctrine. Essential Christian doctrine. The faith. Contained in the word of God. Contend for the faith. You must be energetic in contending for the faith. What does contend mean? To contend. It means to earnestly struggle. It means to strive. It means to fight in the arena. You see, Christianity is not the only game in town. Christianity is not in a vacuum. There are many competing voices in the world. Hey, believe me. No, 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 they're false. Believe me. There are many religions. There are many philosophies that cry to be heard. We must compete in this arena. We must contend for the faith. We believe this is the truth. We believe this has the answers. We believe this is the way. And all the other ways are false. Jesus said it. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. I'm the only way. Jesus said that. We have to contend earnestly for the faith. So you've got to be energetic because you are competing with a lot of other groups and voices out there. You've got to be willing to strive and struggle. You're in the arena. You're a gladiator. You're a warrior. And you're contending for what you believe to be the truth. And then you must be totally convinced. Verse 3. Contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. What's it speaking about there? Once for all, handed down to the saints. It's talking about God's revelation, God's word, the Bible that was given to the saints. It was handed down. It talks about once for all, completed. No deletions, no additions. It's complete. The 66 books of the Bible that comprise our canon of scripture. This is complete. This is what we have to work with. No additions. No subtractions. It's all right here. From Genesis to Revelation. Has been handed down by the prophets and by the apostles. To us. 
You must be convinced this is the Word of God. This is the truth. This is God's Word. You've got to be totally convinced about that. It's authoritative. And then, fourthly, you must stay vigilant, alert. Verse 4. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. False teachers, false prophets, they've crept into the church unnoticed. Why were they not noticed? Because they're clever. You've got to watch out for the creepers, the infiltrators. On the surface, they look genuine. But upon further inspection, they're counterfeits. We're warned about that in 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds, disguised, creeping in. You gotta stay vigilant. You gotta stay alert. Verse 12 talks about them also and the need to be alert. Verse 12 of Jude, it says right here, these men are hidden reefs in your love feasts. They're hidden. Now, we don't sail ships much. I don't think maybe some of you do, but a hidden reef doesn't really mean too much to us. We're land lovers. How about a pothole? You can identify with that. How about a hidden pothole? You couldn't see it and your car hits it and throws your alignment off, flattens your tire, it ruins your day. A hidden pothole, a hidden reef. Very dangerous. These people that creep into the churches, they start slowly and they start to, they start to uh, introduce different teachings. At first, you, you don't see it. But if you hear it long enough, you start to accept it as truth until you examine it further and it's not in the Word of God. And you say, our church has been hijacked. It's been hijacked. We used to be a conservative Bible church, but now we're into all this easy believism, seeker-sensitive type soft Christianity. How did it happen? They crept in unnoticed and nobody sounded the alarm. They're dangerous. They're hidden reefs. Look at the, look at the uh, very, very colorful, very colorful description. Verse 12. These men are hidden reefs in your love feasts. When they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, clouds without water. Boy, that's colorful. Clouds without water. Now in a semi-arid landscape like the Middle East, when you see clouds, you're excited because we need rain. We need rain. And there are clouds forming. Sorry, there's no water. How disappointing. How empty promises. These men that creep in their clouds, very promising. 
but they have no water. No water. Carried along by winds. No weight. Easily carried about. Light. Airy. Fluffy. Unstable. Carried about by every wind of doctrine. No stability. Autumn trees without fruit. You have any fruit trees? Look up there. I got a couple avocado trees. And I've been going out looking up. Nope. I got a few little, little tiny avocados. This is it. This, this year is it. If they don't give me good avocados, I'm cutting the, both those trees down. I've given them four years now. So, no fruit. Wild waves of the sea, verse 13. Wild waves of the sea casting up their own shame like foam. Wild waves, reckless, unpredictable. Unpredictable, they're wild. These people that creep in, they're unpredictable, they're wild. And then it says here, wandering stars. Kind of like probably a shooting star. It makes quite a splash, quite a flame, but it peters out. Flash in the plant. Flash in the pan, but burns out quickly. Description of those that creep into the church. Look out for them. Look out for them. So, I think we're going to put ver uh, the fifth point we're going to carry into next week. Because I just, there's just too much there. And we have four minutes. I don't want to do it injustice. So what have we looked at today? How to contend for the faith. It says to contend for the faith. To fight for the faith. Struggle for the faith. Proclaim the faith. Cling to the faith. How do you do it? You got to be totally submitted to Christ. You have to see yourself as a bond servant. I'm a slave of Christ. I'm his bond servant. You must be overwhelmed by God's amazing work in your life so that you can contend. He called me. He called me to himself and I responded. I had no choice. The irresistible call of God. He called me to be his child. How beautiful is that? I am his beloved he protects me. He keeps me. He cherishes me. Like all the memories of a family. Cherished. You must be overwhelmed by God's amazing work in your life. Christianity is not just a religion. It's a supernatural work of God in the lives of sinful people. He elected you from eternity past. He called you. He justified you. He adopted you. He's sanctifying you. He's going to glorify you someday. When you die, you're going to be glorified. It's all too beautiful. It's all too amazing. When you really sit down and meditate upon it, it's enough to blow your mind. He did all that for you. You weren't even seeking him. If you're going to contend for the faith, you've got to be overwhelmed by God's amazing work. You've got to be totally committed to the faith once for all, handed down to the saints. Totally committed to the faith. You must stay vigilant. Watch out for the creepers that come into the churches and rob the church. Of its 
of its convictions introduce strange things. Always introducing. You know, it's hard to find a Bible church anymore. It really is hard to find. Churches have all kinds of aberrant, maybe not heresies, but strange emphasis and teachings. It's hard to find something pure, scriptural anymore. Why? They've crept into the churches. They crept into the churches. They don't fly the Bible flag. They fly the rainbow flag. A lot of churches fly the rainbow flag. Loud and proud. How'd that happen? They crept in. Little by little. Chipped, chipped it all away. Now churches are selling their buildings to the city or to developers or all kinds of other groups going out of business. Anyway, contend for the faith. Next week we will continue with this theme because we all want to be contenders for the faith. Amen? Amen. Let's uh, invite our ushers forward as we take up this morning's offering. If you're our guest, please, you are not compelled to give. This is for God's people here that are responsible for the ministry on this corner. You're our guest, and we're just glad you came. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you now. Pray you would bless this morning's offering. We ask that you would use it, multiply it for your purposes. We commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen.